Uh, this past week, um, I had the wonderful privilege of participating as an American citizen and as a resident of Arizona in one of our great civic duties. Uh, this is a civic duty that tends to come in the mail uh, when you don't expect it, and it tends to come in the mail when you got too much going on. And what's the civic duty I'm referencing? Jury. jury duty. Oftentimes when I do this and I ask for response, you don't get a lot, but jury duty, everybody's on, on the same page with that one, right? A jury duty. Um, I went down to downtown Phoenix this past week and uh, went to the jury assembly hall and, and sat in there with about, I would say, 150 to 200 people. And by the way, um, I'm from California. The jury duty process, you never think you'd say this, along with like the DMV process out here, is phenomenal compared to California. I mean, it's great. Y'all had coffee ready, snacks ready. It was phenomenal. But I'm sitting in this room with the uh, other people that are possibly going to be selected for jury duty. It's about 150 to 200 of us. And then it comes to a point within the, uh, the day where they begin to divvy us up into different groups. And so you had about 35 over there. You had about another 35 over there. And then I was a part of the bigger group that was about 100 and 125. And the way the, the morning went, if you've been to jury duty in Arizona, you know how it goes. Uh, since everybody has a smartphone, they hand out a sheet of paper and they have you scan it. And it gives you the details for the case that you're possibly going to be on. And so what I learned that morning is if you're a part of the big group, you're probably on a big case. And so I was a part of the massive group. And so I scanned it and I started to read through. And this case was a doozy. I mean, it was going to be Monday through Thursday for three months, I think up to about October 4th, it was a first degree murder case. It was a drive-by shooting. And you can imagine what's going through my mind at this point. There's no way I'm going to get stuck on this one. Like there's absolutely no way. I got to study weekly. I got counseling appointments. Uh, I've got a staff I got to lead. We're moving to church. Like there's no way that I can get stuck on this case right here. I'm more than willing to serve on jury duty, just not right now. And so you move through, and what you do is there's a questionnaire that really works through the case, and then it asks you questions about your integrity, your fitness to serve on the case, and you're doing what everybody's doing in that moment. How should I answer this yes or no? How should I answer this yes or no? I mean, I'm pretty sure if I say no, I'm going to be a, a lot to not be on this jury. Uh, now I, I stand here to say, as everybody's working through that, I, I think I did well. I was honest. I answered with complete integrity, uh, but if I didn't, if I didn't and I eventually got selected, what's the thing that all of us, if you were put on a jury, would have to eventually take when you're getting ready to uh, carry out your responsibilities? What is that? It's an oath. It's an oath. Here's the oath for the state of Arizona that jurors have to state when they're getting ready to participate in a jury. It states this, I quote, do you swear or affirm that you will give careful attention to the proceedings, that you will abide by the court's instructions and render a verdict in accordance with the law and evidence presented to you? And what's that last phrase? So help you God. So help you God. Oaths are necessary because we live in a world full of what? Liars. We, some of y'all laughing, it's true. We live in a world full of lies and we live in a world full of truths. And those, there are situations and circumstances in life that demand that we take oaths or we give oaths in order to guarantee that what comes forth from our mouth is in fact true. And if what does not come out of our mouth can be met with a level of judicial punishment. Oaths are necessary because we live in a time where our world is full of, of lies. Well, as we approach God's word this morning and return to James chapter 5, James is going to deal with oaths. If you look at James chapter 5, verse 12, he's going to use the word swear right there. That word is speaking of oaths, the verbal declaration that you give, whereby which you are bringing God's name and saying, I swear by God. That's what he's going to deal with this morning. And so if you would, grab your copy of God's timeless word and turn with me to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 12, is where we're going to be in our study of God's word this morning. James chapter 5, verse 12. These are the words of the living God. But above all, my brethren, there's that term that's common within the book of James. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth 
or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no. Last part, so that you may not fall under judgment. Uh, Thus concludes the reading of God's word for us this morning. Uh, Let me give you the sermon title very simply. It's Stop Your Swearing. Stop Your Swearing. And let me give you the take-home truth that I would love for us to walk away with. Uh, This is what James is going to press. This is what James, writing 2,000 years ago on parchment, is going to levy upon the conscience of the believers as he pens these words. And this is what the Spirit intends for you and I as believers at Mission Bible Church East Valley in 2023. This is what he intends for us to walk away with as well. The take-home truth is very simply this. The words of a disciple are to be marked by integrity. Personalize it. Your words as a disciple, your proclamations as a disciple, your promises as a disciple, your agreements as a disciple are to be marked by full of integrity. That's what James is going to press. And that's what the Spirit wants us to walk away with, with it being the main impact from this text. And so the way we're going to see this truth unfold before us is by looking at this one verse in three component parts under three simple headings. And so if you have a pen, write the first heading down with me. And I would encourage you to take notes. Point number one, you have the admonition. The admonition. This is going to be our longest point. And it's going to take the most amount of work in order for us to really understand what's here. So just forewarning, uh, you're going to have to put on the thinking caps. You're going to have to endure before we come up for a little bit of air, okay? So just lock in. James chapter 5, verse 12, the admonition. Look at verse 12 again with me. James says, but, that word can also be now. In fact, I think that's a better rendering because there's not really a contrast between verse 11 and 12. Now above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. When you come to this verse as a Bible student, it forces you to ask the question, what is above all in reference to? What is it referring to? Uh, There has been much ink that has been spilled upon pages and commentaries and typed out in commentaries to try to provide clarity on what this phrase is pointing to, what it's connected to. For example, verse 7 through 11, some commentators will say, uh, James is building upon what he said there. So this is how you are to patiently endure unjust suffering. But above all, this is of greater importance. This is of greater significance. Lock into what I'm saying right here. Some will put forth that. Uh, Some will put forth the other idea that this is in reference to the letter as a whole. So in light of everything that I've said, Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, there weren't chapters at that time, but if there were, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, up to 5, verse 11, in light of all of that, but above all, lock into what I'm saying. This is of greater importance. Now, the reality is, as I studied and as I labored and as I worked through this text and prayed and even consulted with the old dead guys that we often call commentary writers, I don't think that either of those are good options. For starters, number one, If you are expecting verse 12 to be connected to verse 7 through 11, you would expect there to be greater connectivity verbally. You've got a small connection with the word judge or judgment there in verse 9 and 12, but really the fabric of verse 12 is fundamentally different than what happens in verse 7 and 11. So I don't think that's a strong option. The other option, which is this is in reference to the whole letter, I think it's hard to substantiate because if we just remember some of the things that we've studied throughout this sermon series, James has dealt with topics like faith and works. He's dealt with topics like not only being a hearer of the word, but being a what? A doer of the word. He's dealt with James chapter three at length, verse one through 12, the idea of the tongue being tamed. And so it's hard to substantiate with absolute dogmatism that James is saying, this is the strongest and most important thing that I want you to hear. And so if that's what I don't believe is being said here, what do I do believe is happening? Well, I think what James is doing very simply is he's bringing to a conclusion a theme and a a dealing with a specific issue that he began in chapter four. Do you remember what he began in chapter four? He was dealing with the believers uh, lapsing into worldliness, with worldliness. 
James chapter 4, he dealt with worldliness creeping into their lives through their sinful conflicts. You remember that? They had selfish ambition. Uh, They were constantly bickering and arguing. That doesn't happen in the church, right? They were constantly at each other's throat and at each other's neck, not for valid and righteous reasons, but because of sinful internal motives. And James dealt with that form of worldliness. You fast forward in James chapter four, he deals with the worldliness of evil and presumptuous planning. Oh God, we're gonna do this. Oh God, we're gonna make this. Oh God, we're gonna accomplish this. Oh God, this is where we're gonna be in a year. And James says, knock it off. You don't even know where you're gonna be tomorrow. God is sovereign. God is in control. Stop planning in disregard of God's sovereignty. He dealt with that form of worldliness. James chapter five, we saw last week, in the past couple of weeks, he's dealing with their lack of patience as they endure unjust suffering. That was a form of of worldliness. And so as he says, but above all, he's dealing with another form of worldliness here, and he's bringing it to a conclusion. He's dealing with their actions of swearing. And the fact that he says above all, it's his way of saying, hey, out of all the forms of worldliness, this one's got to be addressed right now. There can't be any delay. This one's off kilter. This one's got to be amended. This one's got to be adjusted. It's got to stop immediately. Now again, swearing. As I mentioned in the introduction, this is not referring to curse words. This is not referring to potty words or sailor words. I don't know what you call them nowadays. Four letter words, whatever acronym you use to describe them. It's not referring to that. It's referring to the oaths that people were taking as they were bringing God's name into an equation. Let me give you one Greek dictionary's definition of the word swear here. It means to affirm the truth of a statement by calling a divine being to execute sanctions against a person if the statement in question is not true. You get that? Let me read it again. I think it's helpful for us to understand what's being said. To affirm the truth of a statement by calling on a divine being to execute sanctions against a person if the statement in question is not true. Now, what we've got to understand, historically speaking, is that the making of oaths was very popular and was a common practice and even a um, commanded practice in certain contexts in Old Testament Israel. Uh, For example, uh, how many of you guys know that God made an oath by his own name? When you just consider the Abrahamic covenant, uh, Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 22, God swore by who? when he promised that he was going to make Abraham a great nation. He swore by himself. You remember that? Hebrews chapter 6, the author of Hebrews states this in reference to that. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear, I love this, by no one greater, he swore by himself. Verse 14, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, that's Abraham. He obtained the promise. Verse 16, for when men swear by one greater than themselves and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. Verse 17, in the same way, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, the fidelity of what he has promised, he interposed it with an oath. So God made oaths. But not only did God make oaths, God commanded oaths in the Old Testament. You remember some of those examples? There's plenty of them. Let me give you one that many of us don't remember. Numbers chapter 5. Numbers chapter 5. What's happening there? Well, if a woman is believed to have been caught in adultery, she is to go before the priest and she is to swear an oath. And if she is lying, then there are grave consequences under the Old Testament economy. Numbers chapter 5 verse 19. The priest shall have her take an oath and shall say to the woman, if no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray into uncleanness, being under the authority of your husband, be immune to this water of bitterness that brings a curse. Verse 20, if you, however, have gone astray, being under the authority of your husband, and if you have defiled yourself and a man other than your husband has had intercourse with you, verse 21, you got this interlude, then the priest shall have the woman swear with an oath of the curse, and the priest shall say to the woman, the Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people by the Lord's making your thigh waste away and your abdomen smell. swell. 
He said, you got to take this oath. You need to drink this water. And if you are lying, guess what? God's divine judgment is going to cause your abdomen with that water to swell and your thigh is going to waste away. So God commanded for oaths to be taken in the scripture. When you read through the New Testament, the Apostle Paul made oaths. For example, 1 Corinthians or uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 8. For God is my witness. That's an oath. I'm bringing God to substantiate the validity of my claim. For God is my witness, how I long with the affection of Christ Jesus. Jesus himself, the eternal son of God, made an oath. Do you remember when he made an oath? He was on trial. He was before Pilate. And Pilate says, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the son, if you are the Christ. Jesus do. He also gives more while he's under oath. Again, oaths were common. It's important for us to understand this. Let me give you a a longer quote than I typically do from John MacArthur to help us to see this. Again, we're laying framework. Lock in and stay with me. The Jewish system of swearing oaths had its roots in the Old Testament. In a time when written contracts did not exist, oaths served to bind agreements between people. To take an oath was to attest that what one said was true, to call God to witness to that, and to invoke his punishment if one's word was violated. To to call God to witness to the truth of one's promise and to invoke his judgment if one defaulted on that promise was a very serious matter. Oaths were common, but they were serious. This is the reason why. Moses, in Leviticus 19, 12, says this, You shall not swear falsely by my name, so as to profane, treat with contempt the name of the Lord. Again, oaths were common, but they were serious. And so this is where we have to also understand the historical context a little bit more in order to really understand what's happening here. These Jews, who are now Christian, but who are steeped in the practice of making oaths, Because of the seriousness of that uh, venture, what they began to do is they created a system where they had, catch this, binding oaths and non-binding oaths. They did what the Jews often did. They created their own rules in order to fudge it a little bit, in order to leave a back door so that they could kind of fudge the facts when it comes to different oaths that they were making. David Hebert helpfully describes what this looked like And you can find some of this in the Mishnah, which is ancient Jewish writings as well. But he says this, and I quote, Oaths in which the name of God was used were held to be binding, while those in which no direct mention of God's name was made were not held to be binding. Thus, the force of an oath that to all appearances seemed binding could be evaded by minute inaccuracies in the formula used. Thus, they developed the fine art of hiding the truth behind pious oaths. Such a practice of pretending to appeal to God, that's the key. Such a practice of pretending to appeal to God to establish the truth while skillfully framing an oath not considered binding was the worst form of worldliness, close quote. Are you getting the picture of what is happening right here and what James is actually dealing with? They were using these oaths right here, Jeremiah 17, because the heart is deceitful. It's wicked above all else to view them as opportunities to shade the truth. They had this system of binding oaths, non-binding oaths. Well, if we just give a non-binding oath, it's like I cross my fingers behind my back. I can tell partial truth, a little bit of truth. I can just flat out lie and not really have to worry about judgment falling upon me because I did not bring God's name into it. That's what they are doing right here. And this helps us to see a little bit more of why James says what he says next in verse 12. He says, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. These are the non-binding oaths that they began to, to say. Swearing by heaven or earth or any other pious oath was their way of giving a non-binding oath. Uh, we're going to say enough So that when we are promising something, people's minds are going to think that we are giving an oath by invoking God to be a part of this. 
Yet semantically, we're not going to use God's name so that we can actually have an out. We can actually have a back door. We can actually fudge it a little bit and not have to worry about judgment. That's what's happening. This is the same thing that James's older half-brother, Jesus, denounced in Matthew chapter 5. Do you remember that? Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. He quotes the Old Testament. And then listen to what he says in verse 34. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God. Verse 35, by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Verse 36, nor shall you make any oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your statements be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. You know, a common question that comes from this text is, is James and is Jesus rebuking, making oaths, or swearing an oath in all circumstances? No, he's he's not doing that. Is it sinful for a president to take an oath on Inauguration Day? No. Is it sinful for you and I, if we're serving on a jury, to take an oath, to, to swear, to tell the truth? No. Is it sinful to take a vow, which is another form of an oath, on our wedding day, to be faithful and to love and to endure with the loved one that we are bringing or we're being bonded together in, in union? No. What James is rebuking right here is the sinful and ungodly and loose making of oaths that these Jews had brought into their discipleship as followers of Jesus from their old pattern and way of life. That's what's happening. Now, I don't think this is the primary application for this text. We're going to get to it in a little bit, but I do think there is something here for us as Mission Bible Church East Valley in 2023 in light of understanding the historical context here. Uh, This is a sub-application that I believe all of us would agree with. Uh, This is an application that we know by experience. This is an application that we will continue to experience as we are faithful to cultivate an evangelistic heart and people are saved and we enter into discipling relationships with them. And what's that sub-application? Again, not primary application, but sub-application. What is it? It's that when you are saved, not every aspect of your patterns of sin falls off right away. See some shaking your head. You recognize that, right? When you're saved, not every aspect of your sinful patterns of life and living fall off right away. I mean, typically it's the big ones. It's the ones that we receive the most conviction from the Spirit from. These are the ones that we confess, we repent of, we turn from, we get accountability for. Those typically we deal with But there are patterns of sin that are so ingrained in us because of our lives before conversion that we bring into our discipleship with Jesus. And for these believers right here, remember, these were Jewish Christians. And what I mean by that is we're early in the first century. It's probably the first letter that was written in the scriptures from the New Testament perspective. These were people that were primarily Jewish in religiosity. They were converted to Christ. And so what they brought in was their old way of operating and thinking into their discipleship with Christ and in the church. You know how we're guilty of doing that as well. You see, what, what I simply want us to understand and to consider and to think about right here, especially if we're faithful to evangelize, and people are saved, and we say, hey, can I disciple you? Can I, can I help you take your next steps in your walk with the Lord? When we do that, what we've just got to remember is that people are going to bring baggage. People are going to bring sin, and we've got to be humble enough and forbearing enough and patient enough to deal with those things with them. We've got to open up God's Word and say, hey, this is what the Word says about what you're doing. This is what the Word says about what you should be doing. Let's work this out together. This pattern of living is not helpful Let's seek to reform that by the Spirit's help and by the grace of God in obedience to the Scriptures. Brothers and sisters, this is discipleship 101, is it not? Matthew 28. We often think about what portion? The go portion, the make disciples, the proclaiming portion, right? At least when I think of the Great Commission, that's what comes to mind. We're to go to the nations. We're to declare. We're to proclaim. But there's a whole other portion in verse 19. We are to teach people to observe all that the Lord has what? Commanded. 
We're to teach people. See, there, this is discipleship right here. You see, what James is doing simply is he's modeling a pattern for us on how discipleship happens and how sanctification happens. In fact, he models what the Apostle Paul does in his letters often. He tells you these are things that must be what? Put off, right? Let's try that together. These are things that must be what? Put off. off. Ephesians 4. Colossians 3. These are patterns that must be taken off. And then conversely, he says, now that you've taken that off, you must do what? Put on. Put on. He's following Paul's pattern. In fact, look at it under point number two with me when he brings the correction. He said, you got to put this off. I get it. This is what you did when you were unsaved. This was the norm. You had this backdoor way of making oaths where by which you can fudge a little bit on the facts and you could have a door out. But as a believer, no more. Put it off. And then he says, this is what you must put on. Point number two, the correction. The correction. He says, but. Here's a contrast. Don't do that, but do this. Your yes is to be yes and your no, no. I love this. Just like his older half-brother, James gets straight to the heart. Do you sense that there? He doesn't deal with the periphery issues. He, he doesn't deal with their semantics. He doesn't deal with the way that they've created the, a binding system and a non-binding system. He, he doesn't really go there. He could have gone there and highlighted the foolishness of that, but he just jets right past it, and he gets to the heart. What does he say? Be a person of truth. Be a person of integrity. Be a yes, yes, no, no type of individual. Be a person that doesn't have to give oaths because when you speak, you are speaking truthfully and you're speaking with integrity. That's what he's saying. And if you look at verse 12 again, he says, your yes is to be. If you have a pen, circle is to be. Draw it to the margin. That's present imperative That means simply this is to be the reality for you and I at all times. James is simply saying, hey, believer, your word is to be as good as gold at all times, whether it's just a statement you're making, whether it's a promise you're giving, whether it's a declaration that you are declaring. Your word is to be as good as gold. The Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter 4, says what? We are to speak the truth. Congregational context. We are to speak the truth in what? Love. We are to be truth-speaking people. Now, let's just think through why this should be true for me and for you. The reality is, before we were saved, you and I were what? What was our spiritual ancestry? We were children of Satan. I mean, we don't like to think about that, but Jesus was abundantly clear about that, was he not, in John chapter 8? John chapter 8, verse 44, speaking to the religious leaders, he says, you are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. Said you complicitly want to do what Satan does. That's your spiritual father, in quote, outside of Christ. That's your ancestry. You want to do the desires of your father. And notice he describes Satan. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth. Why? Because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and he is the father of what? Lies. He's the father of lies. Why should you and I be a people of truth? It's because we have been born again. We have been saved. We have been transformed. We have been reconciled to Christ. We are no longer dead in trespasses and sins. We've been made alive. We are new creations in Christ. And so what that means very simply is that we had a hardwiring to be people of lies. But the moment the Spirit stepped in, he hardwired us and rewired us to be people of truth. That's why you and I ought to be people of truth. Are you a yes, yes, no, no type of individual? Uh, If you're friends were to answer that question about you. They got a random questionnaire in the mail. Is Caleb a yes, yes, no, no individual? Is McKinnon a yes, yes, no individual? Is Eric a yes, yes, no individual? Is Stephen a yes, yes, no, no individual? Is Marcus a yes, yes, no, no individual? What would they say? 
When they think about what you say and what you declare and what you promise and what you say you're going to do, do they say that person's word is always full of integrity? You can take it to the bank. It's as good as gold. Or would they answer a little bit differently? Are you a yes, yes, no, no type of individual? This reminds me of the young kid that was on uh, the witness stand for a, a pretty important trial. And it came a point where he was being cross-examined, a, a little kid, is being cross-examined by uh, the opponent's attorney. And the opponent's attorney thought that he just got him. Uh, he asked the young boy this simple question. Has your father been telling you to testify or how to testify? To which the young boy simply responded confidently and said yes. Again, as a, an attorney cross-examining him, he thought he had him at that point. Well, would you be willing to tell us what exactly your father is telling you to do? And to say And this is what the boy said, very modestly, very humbly. He said, Father told me that the lawyers would try to tangle me in my testimony. But if I would just be careful to tell the truth, I could repeat the same thing every time. Yes, yes, no, no. That's what the Spirit is asking and calling for you and I to be. And so James tells them, knock it off. He gives them an admonition. I get that you brought this in from your old pattern of life. That's got to stop now. Let me tell you what you should do. This is the correction, point number two. And then he ends, number three, with the motivation. The motivation. He supplies them with a strong motivation. He ends by providing a stimulus for action. He ends by trying to move them internally to consider the seriousness of this situation and for them to amend their ways right away. Where do I get that? Well, look at verse 12, the last phrase. So that, what's the reason? What's the purpose I'm telling you to stop and to do? So that you may not fall under judgment. Now, what is this referencing? Well, for the believer, This is referencing the Hebrews 12 judgment, the divine chastisement, the divine discipline that God will give to his children whom he loves and from his love in order to bring his wayward child back onto the path of righteousness. Uh, The way that we see this out working its way in the scriptures is Psalm 32. His heavy hand will press upon you and will not let up as he drains away, and some of you guys may be here right now, the vitality of spirit as you know that you're living and walking in a way that's not pleasing to him. That's divine discipline. That's God's grace. That's a father saying, I care for you. Another way that this manifests itself is in Acts chapter 5, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, the reality is we don't know how often God does this, but the scripture tells us he does it. Because believers live in a way that does not honor the Lord, they're bringing reproach against the name of the Lord, He'll take their life. He'll snuff it out. He'll say, you're done. The way you're living is not pleasing to me. It's not becoming of a follower of Jesus. So your time is done. It's time to go to glory for you. Again, we don't know when this happens because we don't know the mind of God in these moments, but the scripture does tell us that he, he does it. That's divine discipline. And so for the believer, that's what that's referring to, those realities. But for the unbeliever, And undoubtedly, there were unbelievers that were reading this, or I would even say professing believers. I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus. I was baptized. I'm, 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 I'm tried and true. For these individuals, this means the judgment that all of the wicked and those who are outside of Christ will experience. He's referring to the eternal judgment, the lake of fire. And what James is saying is, hey, hey, consider your ways. Consider the reality that you're constantly uh, giving sinful oaths that give the appearance of appealing to God, yet deceptively you're providing opportunities for you to lie and not tell the truth. Recognize that that's a pattern that does not mirror what a believer will do. That's a pattern that mirrors someone who is not born again and is not saved. So that you may not fall under judgment. You see, this verse deals with oaths very clearly. But if we just understand what's being said here, we recognize very clearly that really what the Spirit is intending for us to walk away with and what James is pressing home is that as disciples of Jesus, you and I are to be marked by integrity. 
We're to be marked by integrity. And so what I want to do for the last five to six minutes is I just want to rattle off a couple of applications for us to consider. And so if you have a pen and a piece of paper, just write these down. Uh, the reality is some of them will be more pertinent to you. Some of them will be more pertinent to others. Uh, all of these won't apply to you specifically, but I trust that maybe one or two will as the Spirit intends this morning. This is not an exhaustive list. There could be more. But here are just a couple that I thought through this morning as I was sitting in my study in final preparation for the sermon this morning. Number one, don't exaggerate the truth. Be a person that doesn't exaggerate the truth. When you tell stories, be accurate with the details. Uh, Don't fudge the facts. Uh, Be careful. Be accurate. It's often a joke that pastors are guilty of this all the time when we tell illustrations. I heard pastor tell that illustration four times, and it seems like the details change every time, and it gets more serious every time. We got to not exaggerate the truth. Number two, uh, don't give half-truths. Don't give half-truths. What I mean by that is the context whereby which you're being um, asked a, a serious question, or maybe it's dealing with a sin issue, or it's something serious of nature, and you're called upon to tell the truth, but you give enough of the truth, maybe it's 50%, or if you're feeling holy that day, maybe you give 85%, and you hold back 15, or you hold back 50, so that you can satiate whoever's asking the question, all the while holds back the part that you don't really want to expose. You see, we got to be people who don't give half truths. We got to give the full truth. Number three, uh, don't tell white lies. <laughs> Kids in the room, you often hear white lies are not that big of a deal, right? White lies don't hurt anyone. But the reality is a white lie has something in common with a very serious lie. And what's that? It's still a lie. It's still a lie. We as disciples of Jesus can never fall into the thinking that because it's not a big deal in society's eyes and no one's going to get hurt by it, that it's okay to be a person who's constantly telling these little lies in life. We don't want to be people who tell white lies. Number four, this is one that's particular to me, and I trust this particular to some of you guys, and I think it'll make sense as I explain it. Uh, We got to stop being people pleasers. What do I mean by that? You're like, that one's out of left field. Well, how many times because you don't know how to say no, you say yes to something that you don't intend to do. Anybody be guilty of that? A couple of y'all, some of y'all are like, I'm serving in kids ministry because of that very reason right now. <laughs> we've got to stop being people pleasers. Like as a church, we've got to cultivate the ability to say no. And now it's got to be rightly rooted. It can't be for selfish reasons or selfish gain, but we've got to get to the spot where uh, we don't say things, we don't promise things, we don't agree to things that we know we're probably not going to do, but because of pressure and not wanting to uh, make someone mad or being a people pleaser, we, we say things that are not true or we agree to things that will not, in fact, happen. <laughs> Number five, uh, some of you guys are guilty of doing this after my sermons. Uh, Stop the sinful flattery. I'm joking. (laughs) Well, I hope I'm joking. Pastor, that was a great sermon. Well, never mind. I teed off on that first. I'm not going to tee off on that one with you guys, but we got to stop the sinful flattery. Uh, The reality is there is moments when we should praise one another for the things that we're doing, but if what the person did is not good, don't go up and tell them, hey, great job. Like, that's just sinful flattery. We can apply that in so many different ways. I think as parents, we do it all the time. Son, you could be anything you want to be. You know that ain't true. Again, that's just another form of flattery when we're talking to our our sons and our daughters. Like, there's just certain realities that are just going to be off limits for you. We got to stop the sinful flattery. Proverbs 29, 5 says, a man who flatters with or flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps. You're setting people up for failure. We got to be truth speaking people. So we've got to stop the sinful flattery. Number six. Oh, this is one that I know all of us are guilty of. Some of y'all probably did this today. Pray for people when you say you're going to pray for them. Pray for people when you say you're going to pray for them. How many of us have been guilty of that? Don't raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. Five days go by. Oh, man, I never prayed for them. We may have had the intention to pray for them, but we never wrote it down. We weren't intentional with it. And so there was no recourse that reminded us to make good on that promise. In a context like ours, as intimate as we are, 
and as how much we rely on prayer. If we say we're going to pray for someone, we need to pray for someone. So that's a way that we can cultivate truthfulness. Uh, Number seven, we need to speak the truth even when it's hard. There are situations in my life right now where I'm going to have to speak the truth and I'm not looking forward to it. There are circumstances in life for us who are maybe more timid in nature where you know you got to say something, but you just don't want to say it. And instead of fudging on what you're supposed to say or leaving out some of what you say, we've got to lean into that and we've got to ask for the Spirit's help and we've got to speak the truth in that moment in a way that honors the Lord. One of the ways we grow in truthfulness as a people is that we speak the truth even when it's hard. And then number eight, repent when you tell a lie. Repent. How many of you guys know that you are not perfect? I trust that everyone knows this. Uh, The reality is sometimes I think even within Bible churches, we create what's called a functional perfectionism. Uh, Owen Strand really dealt with this well on a a thread I saw. We create this standard where everybody feels like they have to present themselves as perfect. And so nobody ever really recognizes that they are not perfect and they're sinful and um, you, you can't confess things and you can't work things out because you're struggling. The reality is you and I are not gonna be perfect. You're not perfect. Let's do this. Repeat it after me. I'm not perfect. One, two, three. I'm not perfect. Oh, how liberating that is. I'm not perfect. Nor will I ever be. Paul knew he wasn't perfect. Philippians 3, I press on. The reality is until Jesus calls you home, you will probably at some point lie again. The difference between you and me and the world, though, is we recognize the conviction of the Spirit. We confess it, we repent of it, and we turn from that. Repent when you tell a lie. See, God desires, I said nine, I only have eight, sorry. God desires for his disciples to be marked by integrity in their speech. If you and I are going to be salt and light in this world that is dark, it's decaying, and it's decrepit, then that means our speech must be different. This is to be true not only with what we say, meaning the words we use, but this is to be true with the integrity underneath and undergirding the words that we use. This is to be true not only with the content, but also with the veracity We live in a world that requires oaths to be taken because we live in a world that is full of liars and lies. See, but what God intends, what the Spirit intends for you and I is that you and I would be a people in a world full of lies that are known for truth. See, what I want Mission Bible Church East Valley to be known by and known for as you interact with people, as you apply for jobs, I want them to say, oh, they attend that place or they're followers of Jesus, universal. That's a person of integrity. That's a person who says something and means what they say, and we can trust their word. We are gospel-transformed people, and as Christians, that means that you and I and our speech is to be different. The words of a disciple are to be marked by integrity. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your precious word right now. We thank you for the opportunity to come together as the people of God and to consider what you would have us grow in collectively as a local church body. And so my prayer now is that corporately as a church, as we consider James 5 verse 12, having been informed, I believe, with the Spirit's help of what is being said here and why it's being said, that we would, by the grace of God and by the Spirit's work, be enabled to live out what we have studied. And so make us a truthful people, Make us a people that we have words when we speak that as good as gold when people hear them. May we be known for that. And so, convict us where conviction needs to be brought. And I pray and ask that if there's anyone in here that is far from you, O oh God, that you would save them. You would open their eyes at this very moment. That you would help them to see, even as we take communion in a moment, that there is one who came and lived and died and stood in their place, bore your wrath so that by faith alone and grace alone, they could be saved and be forgiven of their sin and be made a child of yours. And so may you do that for anyone in this room right now that you're leading to come to that spot of faith. We love you, Lord. 
we thank you. Seal these truths to our hearts. It's in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen.